stream. So we have a whole bunch of other people who you can't see right now. We're very excited tonight. This is a, a wonderful event and you have a great presentation to look forward to. My name is Terry Wallace and I serve as the Associate Vice President for Research and the Dean of University Extended Campus. My job tonight is simply to give you a preview of the evening and introduce our University President. But first I want to thank Julie Jorg. I hope you'll help me. Julie. Julie, thank you. Thanks, everyone. She coordinated with our IT folks, with um, creative publications, with the president's office, with catering, with Phil, and that was the toughest part, let me tell you. Um, and so she really, she really um, did a ton of things to make tonight go well. So tonight, um, first, we're going to hear from our 2022 Douglas R. Moore Research Lecturer, followed by questions. I hope you've been saving those up because he's ready for them. After that, our president will return to the stage to announce the 2023 Douglas R. Moore Award recipient, followed by a reception right outside those doors. So I hope you'll come and um, ask more questions and hang out and have some treats. So let's get to it. Dr. Edward Inch began as the 13th president of Minnesota State University Mankato, July 1st of 2021. Throughout his career, Dr. Inch has consistently demonstrated that he is a strategic leader who understands the importance of working in a collaborative, transparent, and authentic manner to build a shared vision, a vision 
that will ensure the success of all the students we work with and will secure the university's future. So please join me in welcoming President Inch to the stage. Well, thank you, Terry. That's very kind. And, and you know, to everybody here and, and online, uh, welcome. I'm very pleased to be uh, uh, involved with the 48th annual Douglas R. Moore Faculty Research Lecture. This is one of those exciting times where we have a forum where our, our uh, people get to share what the work is that they've been doing and the importance of that work for all of us here, but beyond our, beyond our walls and beyond our communities. And I enjoy listening to these because I think this is where we have a lot of good ideas that get shared, questions that get answered, and challenges that we, we have moving forward. So the Douglas R. Moore Faculty Research Lectureship Award honors a faculty member who is engaged in an activity that demonstrates a quality of excellence in discovery and provides a venue for sharing that knowledge in a manner that enriches the intellectual life of the university community. And given that we're right at the beginning, right almost at the beginning of April, which launches our research month, our undergraduate research month, it seems fitting to have one of our best professors lead that off with a discussion of some of his significant work. So tonight, I'm very pleased to introduce the recipient of the 2022 Faculty Research Award, Professor Philip Larson. Who's, yeah. <laughs> professor Larson is the director of the Earth Science Program, a full professor in the Department of Geography. And as we were sitting before we started here, he was hoping that you all have good questions. So as his dean suggested, maybe what is the longest river in South, Southern Africa? I have no idea, but sounds like a good question. His presentation, though, in, in all seriousness, is going to focus on our current understanding of the birth and evolution of rivers and their valleys, with particular focus on the major rivers of southwest United States, critical water resources to rapidly growing population centers like Phoenix, Arizona. And having just moved from California, this is a very near and dear topic because it affects so, so much of how people are able to live in the different parts of our country. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Philip Larson. His presentation is titled, How Rivers Are Born and Evolve, A Paradigm Shift in Earth Science. Thank you. Be great. Just making sure it works. <laughs> All right, well thank you everybody. Um, so thank you for allowing me to give the Douglas R. Moore Faculty Research Lecture this evening. As President Inge said, it's entitled, How Rivers Are Born and Evolve, A Paradigm Shift in Earth Science. Uh, my name is Philip Larson. He basically did a wonderful job of introducing who and what I am, so I'm just gonna move right into it. Um, before I start tonight, I wanna make sure to thank my collaborators. And what I'm talking about here is the last 12 years of my research. Uh, that has sort of culminated in uh, what you see on the right-hand side here, a special issue in the Journal of Geomorphology that was published this year. Uh, those with asterisks next to their names were actually the co-editors with me. I was the lead managing editor of this special issue that included a lot of the work that we're gonna talk about this evening. But I also wanna thank the other folks listed here who have been colleagues, friends, and collaborators in many other aspects of the work that I'm gonna talk about tonight, sort of creating this unifying theme of my research for the last 12 years and allowing me to be a full professor and present this work to you all this evening. So I wanna thank all of them, but I mostly want to thank the Geography MS and Earth Science BS students that have provided the enthusiasm and inspiration and occasionally have been actual collaborators in the publications and research that has come out of this this work, and also some that are actually published in this special issue. So, uh, you know, the, the philosophy here at Minnesota State, since I've been here, has been this idea of a teaching scholar. And really, that's what I've tried to do. And so those students have been crucial to all of this work so far. Um, so a little bit about me, and so that you understand my sort of um, perspective when I think about rivers and their landscapes. For most, uh, when we think about rivers, we think about the communities along them, and we can think about the long history of human culture and society and civilization that has grown along major rivers. And as a young child, I grew up in the town of Prescott, Wisconsin, you see over here on the right-hand side on the map. Uh, Prescott is at the confluence of the St. Croix and Mississippi rivers. And so for me, the river and the landscape were always part of that town. It was part of who I was growing up in that town. 
And I had heard stories from family and friends that the river had always been there. It's part of life there. And I thought about this a lot uh, as I started becoming an earth scientist uh, as my career went on, um, that many people, human beings, um, think about the river and their landscapes and the communities along them as sort of a sense of permanence, that the river has always been there and it always will be. But as I learned more in earth science, I started to realize that that is at odds with the vastly different time scales of geologic time. That rivers are actually born, they evolve, and they cease to be over those vast time scales. And so when we look at this, we can look at our own city here in Mankato, and we can see that Mankato exists at the confluence of many different rivers. And we can look back to 1870, where we see this artist's painting of Mankato then. And we see the same Minnesota River with a lot more boat traffic, uh, but the same Minnesota River there then. And we can look at uh, Phoenix, Arizona in the bottom here, uh, where the Salt River flows through Phoenix, a uh, city of about four and a half million people today, uh, literally superimposed on uh, a society called the Hohokam peoples that were there over a thousand years ago that built canals, many of which we basically reactivated and kind of reconstructed. Uh, and so for thousands of years, you can see the imprint of society and rivers. But these vastly different time scales of geologic time, uh, as I learned this, it made me kind of wonder and curious, like how does this happen? How do we suddenly get a river into a landscape? Where does it go? And once a river shows up, what happens to that landscape through time? And so I take students to places like this, and many of you are probably familiar with this. This is the Grand Canyon of the Colorado River. And Dr. Ron Shermer in the audience tonight is sitting right here with a bunch of the students. And we look at the Grand Canyon and I tell them this story about the geologic history here. That as of 100 million years ago, the rivers in this region were actually flowing to the northeast. Today, the Colorado River carves Grand Canyon and flows to the west. How did this change occur? And I take students in our own backyard in the Minnesota River Valley. And as of 15,000 years ago, the Minnesota River Valley didn't exist. It was covered in glacial ice. And then suddenly this river and its valley emerged in the landscape. So it leads to a lot of interesting questions, but really the major overriding theme of this is how are rivers born? And how are rivers born, when they're born, what happens to the landscape in response? That's really been the driving force for a lot of the work that I've done. Uh, so as any good scientist would do, we look back in the prior scholarship. We look back at what prior work has been done and what people think about that work to try to answer this question. And a couple of important terms that I want to introduce to you all tonight uh, that helps explain things as we go through this are drainage integration and transverse drainages. Drainage integration you can simply think of as landscapes that aren't connected hydrologically. But if we integrate those basins, we have a river flowing between them. So this is an important term that we're gonna talk about here when we're talking about the birth of a new river. And oftentimes to integrate drainages or drainage basins, it requires something called a transverse drainage where the river literally needs to cross a divide or barrier to flow between those two landscapes. And so we get these transverse drainages that we can see in things like aerial photos and topographic maps and LIDAR DEMs and things like that that allow us to see the topography of Earth's surface. And these transverse drainages tell us a story that these drainages have integrated these basins, okay? So if we can figure out what caused the transverse drainage, we can figure out how the river was born. So for the last 130 years in earth science, there's been what I call a paradigm that most researchers and many have cited, as you see down here, have discussed. And this paradigm is called stream piracy via headward erosion. And this paradigm has been very persuasive. And we can look at an example of this and talk about this concept, just so you can understand what the major point I'm gonna to get to later on tonight, is that we can look at this example of the Colorado River through Grand Canyon again. And what I've highlighted here in the red circle is something called the Kaibab Plateau. And the Kaibab Plateau is at literally a mountain range that's thousands of feet higher than the surrounding landscape. We all know rivers do not flow uphill, yet what you can see here is that the river seemingly crosses that mountain range. And so this is a transverse drainage. This is one of these things where we look at it and go, how the heck did this happen? We were able to integrate these two landscapes on either side of this mountain range. And the research to date has largely focused on this idea of stream piracy via headward erosion to explain phenomenon like this. And what this basically tells us is that 
these two landscapes, one of these landscapes without the river in it, erodes back across that barrier, across that divide between the two landscapes. And eventually it erodes back far enough that it captures the upstream hydrology and reroutes it through that divide, creating a new river system. Well, I'm here to tell you that this process that's commonly talked about is really, it requires a, a lot of rethinking. Uh, a lot of the modern research here has suggested that both in numerical and physical modeling that this is a really inefficient process. When we try to demonstrate this in computer models and try to create this in physical models, it's really difficult to do. When we actually investigate places where this is prescribed in real physical landscapes, we often find that other processes are responsible or that trying to understand this process and how it would unfold in that landscape is nearly impossible. It's very, very inefficient. And in fact, in 1995, a guy named Bishop wrote this quote in, in the finding of his paper, where he concluded saying that basically drainage rearrangement via river capture is a really, really rare occurrence. And so it really requires us to stop and think about what we understand about how rivers are born in landscapes, how this process works. Unfortunately, as the Mandalorian would say, this is the way, or headward erosion and piracy is the way. And so as a scientist, I sit there and look at this and I wonder why that is. And so I started reaching out to colleagues and friends that did similar research. I started looking at this myself in more depth. And what I was able to find was that there are two major problems here. One is a pedagogical bias that is entrained in our field. This pedagogical bias, we were able to discover this by basically looking at the textbooks people use in their classes when they teach generations of earth scientists. And what we find is that uh, almost all of the textbooks actually talk about stream piracy and headward erosion. But very few of them talk about other mechanisms that can result in the same phenomenon. In particular, there's one mechanism that we'll highlight later that is never mentioned in a single textbook we looked at. And so I'll get to that in just a little bit. The other major problem is actually in the science itself, in the peer-reviewed literature. There's misconceptions, muddled thinking, and misuse of this terminology that is rampant. And it really kind of lets you start to wonder about why this paradigm is sort of entrained in us. But then you start to think about this pedagogical bias and it makes sense. Generations of earth scientists are taught this and it's stuck in our brains and we're not able to think about it in any other way. Yet reviews, modeling, and field studies suggest otherwise today. I wrote this in 2017 that kind of sums up the findings of trying to understand this problem. Textbooks confuse headward erosion with nick point recession. Okay, this is a completely different process. And it leads to the mistaken belief that stream piracy can be caused by the growth of a, a vigorous gully that's eating its way headward across the landscape. And this is an issue of muddled thinking that's been sort of talked about for over 50 years, but it hasn't caught steam. And I'm not quite sure why, except for this pedagogical bias issue. And what they're talking, or what I'm talking about here is when we look in our own backyard, we can see examples of this. This is Miniopa Falls, uh, Miniopa Creek flowing just, uh, just in the wintertime, beautiful landscape, right? Well, we got this nice, beautiful waterfall here. And what's happening is headward erosion is occurring here. But there's a river flowing over this waterfall, right? And that river allows that waterfall to erode back through time, upstream, deepening the landscape, widening the valley through time. And this makes sense because having that flow allows for erosion to occur. It makes it an efficient process. And we can see this in the landscape looking at the topography here. We can see Miniopa Falls right here, pointed to by the Black Arrow. And we can see that the valley has grown from the Minnesota River Valley back this far through time. But when we look at the surrounding landscapes, we can see little gullies here that don't have the flow going into them. They don't have the hydrologic input to drive that erosion. And they don't go back very far. Yet this is commonly discussed as the way we get transverse drainages and create new rivers and new landscapes. So some seminal work that happened, um, I'm not including my own as the seminal work, but it is here where I reviewed and synthesized a bunch of the work that was going on, uh, really pointed out to the things that we needed to really address, that there's really four general mechanisms that are responsible for these transverse drainages. And those are here on the right-hand side. We have antecedents, superimposition, overflow and spillover, and piracy and capture. Now, when we're asking the question about how a river is born, these two, superimposition and antecedents, don't count. These are actually situations where the river's already there in the landscape, 
and eventually comes, cuts through a barrier to flow. In antecedents, the barrier is uplifted and the river cuts down through it. In superimposition, the river is cutting down through the landscape, exposing a buried bedrock high, okay? But in overflow and spillover, we're actually creating a new river and a new landscape. And we already talked about piracy and capture being a very inefficient process. So this is the one I want you to pay attention to tonight, overflow and spillover. Because what I've found in my work is that this is ubiquitous across many landscapes, in many geographic settings across the planet. So we can look at a case study of this, a place where transverse drainages are abundant in the landscape. Uh, and we can look at a place where we know uh, in the geologic history that these rivers have drastically transformed and completely reversed course. And what I'm talking about here is the southwestern United States. This is the Colorado River Basin. And what we see in the Colorado River Basin is it's flowing to the southwest into the Gulf of California. But as of 100 million years ago, as we just talked about with Grand Canyon, the rivers were flowing to the northeast, flowing into the continental interior. And that's because there was large mountain ranges to the west and southwest that these rivers were flowing from. But over, over time, those drainages actually became internally drained, and then they reversed course. They became internally drained because the Rocky Mountains formed and blocked their path. And then they reversed course for a reason I'm going to show you in just a second here. But in this special issue that we published, two papers really helped us understand when this occurred and how it occurred, this drainage reversal. And these two issues I actually reviewed and was editor on, uh, or these two articles, uh, about 16 and about 15 million years ago, according to these two studies, drainages started to reverse course and flow to the southwest. And so this sets the stage for how rivers are born and the work that we did next. But these two animations first will show you why this happened. So what you're seeing here is actually compressional tectonics that built these large mountain ranges to the west and southwest in the southwestern United States. But about 25 to 20 million years ago, extension began. The crust literally began to rift itself apart and stretch. And what this did is it collapsed those mountain ranges. Therefore, those rivers that used to flow to the northeast were not flowing from, the north, from those mountain ranges anymore. And they began to reverse course. They began to flow to the southwest. And what we get from that extension is a tectonic regime that results in topography that looks like this. This is a very simplified version here where we have mountain ranges and basins in between those mountain ranges. And when I think about this landscape, this is what I think about. I'm pretty sure my students think that I sit in a bathtub and think about bathtubs. In reality, I do think about these basins as bathtubs because the idea is, is the mountain ranges actually create the rim of the bathtub. And everything, all the sediment, all the water that is in that basin fills up through time until somebody pulls the plug. And so when we look at the rivers of the southwestern United States, particularly in Arizona, we see the Gila, the Verde, the Salt River here. And I painted them in nice pretty colors for you all to see because what we're seeing here are several basins here that these rivers cut across. They're literally cutting across this landscape, connecting bathtubs. And so the question is, is how do we cut through mountain ranges and connect these bathtubs to create a through flowing river system? And so here's another map that shows what I'm talking about here. This map is showing the depth of these basins. And the red line here is the Verde River. The blue line here is the Salt River. Phoenix, Arizona is right about here, okay? And what we're seeing here are these arrows. These arrows are pointing to each basin that is connected, each bathtub that is connected. The little explosion marks are pointing to individual transverse drainage locations. So each explosion marks a point where the two bathtubs connected. And so in looking at these, we can try to understand what's happening at each one of those little explosion marks to tell the story of how these bathtubs connected through time, how these rivers were born. And so how do we do that? Well, we spent, uh, myself spent about the last 12 years running around this landscape trying to look at everything I could find. The landforms, the sedimentary deposits, markers of erosion in the landscape that could tell us the story of how this landscape evolved. And what we see here is that we have a series of basins as we're talking about, but these little black boxes are these transverse drainage locations. Crucially important sites to really understand how this system has evolved through time. These dashed lines here around these other boxes, these are actually really important or key sites that are landforms that tell us part of this story. And what we do is then we map these things out. 
We try to understand their spatial relationships, their vertical relationships, and connect them throughout space so that we can understand what they're telling us about how the landscape changes. And so what you're seeing here in this image, uh, I got to actually fly in an airplane, which is really cool, and take pictures hanging out the window. Um, and these are what we call stream terraces. These stream terraces, if you imagine the Minnesota River today, we can see the floodplain of the river. Imagine if the Minnesota River suddenly becomes more erosive and it cuts down into that landscape. It would abandon that floodplain higher than the modern river level. And that's exactly what we're seeing here along the Salt River in Arizona. These little bumps in the landscape are actually former floodplains preserved higher than the surrounding river, telling us that the river has cut down episodically through time, dramatically changing the landscape as it does. And so just to give you my perspective, because I see a lot of faces out there that are looking at me like, what? Uh, well, this is me standing on top of what's called the Stewart Mountain Terrace, the highest terrace of the Salt River. You can see these big rounded gravels up here that are indicative of river transport. And you look in a distance and you can see these little benches way out in the distance here, and I'll highlight them for you. These are those stream terraces. And so I spent a lot of time trotsing around the desert mapping these things out to try to understand these floodplains and their morphology, their form and mapping them out across the landscape to understand where they are and how they relate to one another. In addition to that, we look at the sediments within these basins. So deep within these bathtubs, we core down, especially in this big pink basin, to try to understand the rocks that are being deposited in them through time. And what we see using a really cool thing like this is that we're able to pull out what we call class assemblages, the variations in rock types with depth. And what we see in these cores, about 80 well logs that we call them, uh, we see a sudden and rapid arrival of gravels that are consistent with the Salt River beneath our feet in these basins. So the Salt River suddenly arrives on top of what we call basin fill, sediments that were just shedding off the local mountain ranges, filling these bathtubs through time. So suddenly and rapidly, the Salt River comes into this landscape. What's really cool about it is we're also able to date when that occurs using a technique called cosmogenic nuclide burial dating. So about 2.1 to 2.7 million years ago, we were able to figure out that that's when the Salt River suddenly arrived in this landscape. And so we have these, these morphological, sedimentological, and geochronological pieces of evidence that now allow us to come back to the modeling work that I presented before by John Douglas and Douglas and Schmeckley and things that I reviewed in Larson et al. in 2017. And we're able to look at the criteria those, those works established to help us understand what mechanisms might be driving the transverse drainages that we see. And so we can first look at the upstream basin, the Tonto Basin up here, and look at that first big explosion mark. What is going on there? And when we look at the evidence in the landscape and map everything out, we see a pretty clear signal that the evidence points towards overflow. And what this tells us is that a big lake filled up this basin, eventually overtopping the rim of the bathtub. Imagine turning on the spigot in your bathtub and letting it go and not pulling the drain. That's what happens here. It goes over the low spot and it begins to spill over across the landscape. And what this does is it generates a true nick point, a waterfall, just like we talked about at Miniopa Falls, that then eats back into that basin, exposing more water and more sediment that then begins to flush out downstream into these lower basins. What's interesting about this too is that looking at those well logs from the Higley Basin downstream, we see the rapid and sudden arrival of those gravels. And this is consistent with the overflow hypothesis as well. And we see in these maps here, these are all our individual well logs. All those little dots are all the different well logs we looked at to try to figure out what was beneath our feet and saw that ancestral salt river deposits filling up this basin for literally two million years. So this integration event occurred from the Tonto Basin spilling over down into the Higley Basin. For two million years, it filled up with these gravels. And eventually, it filled up to the point where it integrated the next basin. The sediments got so high that they began to actually spill over into what's called the Loop Basin, right here. And so this is Phoenix Airport, very key site for some of this work. And so this is the general story that I presented in a paper in 2020, that basically the Salt River integrates, comes down here, and is flowing to the south, filling in this area in white called the Ancestral Salt River Deposits. That's our big uh, uh, arrival of gravels into the Higley Basin. It fills up and overtops the low spot in the bathtub and spills over into the Loop Basin. And the Loop Basin is about 40 meters lower based on the well logs we have there. This again generates another nick point. 
which we'll look at in just a second. So if all of this information is correct, if this idea that we're having this sort of top-down spillover process that's integrating these basins, if this is correct, uh, the terraces that we observed and mapped out should all post-date that integration event. And so we dated all of those terraces to try to figure out how old they were, when those floodplains were abandoned episodically through time. And sure enough, if you look at it, all those dates do. So the terrace story fits the basin story. On top of that, we're able to also date the arrival of sediments in the Luke Basin. So when all of those sediments from the ancestral salt river deposits filled up and spilled over, we're actually able to date when they arrived right next to the Phoenix airport. So we're able to connect those dots. So essentially, what's going on right here? And so at about 40 meters in depth, we get a date of about 460,000 years ago that this spilled over and the salt river arrived into the Luke Basin. So there's the Phoenix airport again. And turns out, our dates within the Higley Basin of those gravels filling in from the Salt River fit this as well. It was a grading or filling in till at least a half, uh, half a million years ago. Our date 460,000 years ago fits that story. And so when it did spill over, it generated a nick point that began to rapidly erode back upstream. Okay? And keep in mind here, this is headward erosion, true headward erosion here because there is a river that's able to do this. And what it does is it sets off a wave of incision. It starts abandoning the former floodplain of the river, cutting down through the landscape through time in a series of stair steps where we see these stream terraces form. And a guy named Troy Payway in the 1970s actually created this nice cartoon showing that all of these terrace surfaces actually converge into the Higley Basin. They all slope down together with the highest terraces and oldest terraces having the steepest slope. And what he suggested was that the headwaters of the Salt River were actually uplifting through time. Unfortunately, there's very little evidence to suggest that this is going on. There's very little tectonics in the last two million years. So what we're really seeing in this part of the basin is actually the extension of the drainage basin, the growth of the long profile of the river. Essentially, the river itself is eating back through the landscape. And so we're seeing the oldest terrace slope, sloping down here, the next oldest, the next oldest, and now the modern river. So they seem to converge together in the downstream basin. And the important implications of this is that this leads to massive change in these basins. It, incredibly large and quick scales of erosion where every time the river is cutting down like this, we're cutting apart the landscape and flushing out a lot of sediment out of that landscape, including in places like this. These are what are called pediments in front of mountain ranges. They're made out of granite. And these things are actively incising and removing all of that granitic rock and flushing it downstream through time. So the arrival of these rivers leads to very, very drastic changes to these landscapes through time. And we were actually able to reconstruct some of these former surfaces using relic landforms and project them out to figure out how fast and how much material was actually being flushed out during these events. And some of these are truly astonishing, though it may not mean much to you. Those that study geology and, and geomorphic processes, these are really incredibly fast scales of erosion, especially in crystalline bedrock and granites and very difficult to erode materials. So, Bringing this all back home, uh, a paper my students, my graduate students, led by uh, a student named Zach Hilgendorf and I put together um, really sort of brought this larger theme um, to fruition. Uh, and really, this is the way. And what we did is we scoured the literature. Knowing what we were seeing in the, in the Salt River and much of the southwestern United States and thinking about landscapes even in our part of the world, we realized that there was something wrong here with the story of stream piracy and headward erosion. And so we started looking at all of the literature we could find where we were looking at basically the birth of a new river. And we were mapping those things out. And what we found was that top-down integration, drainage integration processes, were extraordinarily common, even though they're never talked about in textbooks and they're misused or uninformed in peer-reviewed literature. And so we mapped out all of the locations we could find in the literature. And I'm sure we missed some, but there's a heck of a lot here. We did it also in the United States to bring it close to home. And in reading all of that, we were basically able to summarize it in these three models for how this process works. 
The first of which is lake overflow. Basically, a big lake fills in the basin and spills over, and we get uh, the integration process to unfold. The second one in the middle here is something called aggradational spillover, where it basically fills up with a bunch of sediment and then eventually spills over the bathtub. And the third is something we call aggradational piracy, where a river aggrades and then spills over or cuts through the barrier to flow. And so these are really the major mechanisms that we find repeatedly in the literature that actually explain a birth of a new river into a new landscape. And so coming back to our Salt River story, we see all three of these. So this integration point is actually uh, aggradational spillover. This integration point is lake overflow, and this one is uh, aggradational piracy. So we can see all three of these in the Salt River. Come on. Here we go. Uh, in the special issue as well, we revisit Grand Canyon. Uh, and we look at this story of the Kaibab Plateau and this integration event. And there is compelling evidence that this is also a lake overflow event that happened probably about five and a half million years ago. Uh, my colleague who's in the audience tonight, Dr. Andrew Wicker, uh, shows a similar process happening with the integration of the Mississippi River that the Mississippi River hydrology as we know it today was very different about two and a half million years ago. The rivers around this region were actually flowing to the northeast. And then what we had was basically a lake overflow event that rerouted the Mississippi to the south as we know it today. And even our work now, again with Dr. Wickard in the Minnesota River Valley, is actually another really interesting place of this birth of a new river in the last 15,000 years. And what we see using this criteria, this, this knowledge of, of different transverse drainage events, is we can actually pick this out too. All of the evidence points very strongly to a lake overflow event. And we've known this for a while with the Minnesota River Valley, but nobody has really tried to flush it out. We've sort of just taken it for granted for the last sort of 100 years or so that this is the story. Well, we're trying to work on this to really understand this and link this process across multiple landscapes. And so what you're seeing here is Dr. Andrew Wickard in a big pile of sand and gravel that rapidly filled in this valley after the lake flowed through. Sound familiar? Just like the Salt River. This is essentially the ancestral Salt River deposits filling in this landscape after Lake Agassiz spilled through and cut this valley. And what are the implications for this? Just like along the Salt River, massive erosion in these basins. As the river arrives, it transforms the landscape dramatically. And there's lots of media service about this, uh, looking at landslides, ravine growth, and those sorts of processes that are causing lots of issues for people in our communities. A former master's student who was a geography MS student and earth science BS student mapped out over 1,500 landslides between New Ulm, Minnesota and St. Peter, Minnesota in the Minnesota River Valley. This suggests this landscape is incredibly active, erosional processes are rampant, and this valley is transforming through time as a result of the arrival and birth of this river. And you can see that in the ravines. This is an example of what we mapped out. So you can see the detail that we went to to try to understand what's going on here. And we can see these events in real time while we were doing this study. In 2018 and again in 2020, this large landslide blocked Highway 68 between New Ulm and Mankato. In uh, 2019, this mudslide blocked the southbound end of Highway 169 between St. Peter and Mankato. Here is Judson Bottom Road and cut my colleague Mark Bowen looking at a rockfall event that literally blocked the road there. Imagine a car going through here and going, uh-oh, right? So this is a dramatically changing active landscape. And none of these processes would be occurring without the birth of this river. So that birth of this river really tells us a story here, helps us understand what's happening in these landscapes. And maybe my favorite part of this story happened in the last year. Uh, we started getting cited by these folks that were looking at the Martian landscape. And they started to point out the same thing there. And what they were seeing in this was that uh, about three and a half million years ago on Mars, uh, climate was very different. And there is very clear evidence that we had uh, lakes filling up meteor craters, but also depressions and spilling over creating river systems and networks on Mars. And in fact, they mapped it out on the entire Martian surface. All the white lines you see here, all these white little circles, these are basins that filled up with water and spilled over, creating rivers. And the black lines that you see here are actually drainage networks that evolved in response to those events. So this is really cool. It's beyond just Earth. It's broader than that. And this starts to give some credence to the idea that this is a very ubiquitous thing, that it's happening 
in any time you have river systems, right? The birth of river systems, this is very, very common. And so I wanna just you know, sort of bring it all home with this, that um, this idea of top-down drainage integration is really the fundamental driver, uh, I think, of how we kind of birth rivers in a landscape. So I just wanna end by saying thank you to my dog Zion, who has been my field assistant for the last 12 years, um, my two boys, Henry and Logan, uh, for putting up with me and all of my nerdery, and uh, my significant other and partner in crime, Liz. Little did she know that I'd be dragging her to beautiful places, and I'm really thinking about bathtubs the whole time. Uh, now, more to come, right? Uh, pay, pay if you guys are interested in this sort of work. Keep following what I'm doing, and there's a lot more that's coming very, very soon. Uh, with that being said, I want to open this up for questions if anybody has any. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, Phil. Yeah. That was awesome. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so now, if you have a question, you really do need to speak into this, all right, so that they can hear on um, the live stream. And here I come. Thanks, Jerry. Phil, great talk. Thank you. Can you chat a little bit more about how the revolution in numerical age dating allowed you to do this work? Sure. Going from what Troy Payway was able to do to what you are now able to do. Yes, uh, certainly. So one of the fundamentally key parts of this is being able to date the age of things and connect the dots that way. And, and uh, the dating technique, cosmogenic nuclide dating, has really revolutionized our ability to do that. We were able to date um, sediments in uh, these basin deposits, but also the landforms in these stream terraces to figure out when they formed. And they are so old that uh, prior techniques in Choi Peiwei's day, like carbon dating, didn't work. And so being able to do this uh, really uh, has allowed us to really understand these processes in a much greater way. And we're doing similar work using cosmogenic nuclides in, in uh, the upper Midwest right now, actually. So it's, a, it's a definitely a, a benefit, and <laughs> it makes me happy that we're actually able to, to figure this out. I know my former PhD advisor has been puzzling over this question for decades. And now that we have the ability to date things, we're able to finally tie it together. So, yeah. Good question. Um, anybody else? All right. Yeah. <laughs> First great talk, Phil. Thank Thanks you. for giving that. Um, well, uh, my question is, it seems like there's a, a, this is gonna require an incredible amount of water. So if you could talk about what is the source of filling up these bathtubs, um, and then on your map of the United States, there was a, you know, a pretty significant number of these sites. Yep. Could you talk about their temporal patterns? Sure, so um, in not all cases does it require a significant amount of water. So the three mechanisms that can create top-down integration, these spillover processes, one of them is lake overflow, uh, and that does require a significant amount of water. So uh, one of the looming questions that is in, in our future research plans for the Southwest is to try to understand how those big bathtubs filled with lake water like that. And it turns out that it's not the only system that did it. The Gila River did it, the Verde River did it, many of them are doing it. And it turns out that they're all doing it at about the same time. And so what we think is that it's very much tied to a climatic transition at what's called the Pliocene-Pleistocene boundary, where it got wetter and colder in the Southwest than it is today and potentially filled up those bathtubs. But the key point I wanna uh, make is that it doesn't necessarily always have to be lake overflow. Um, it can actually be uh, sediment filling in these basins over long periods of time of erosion shedding off of the mountain ranges, filling the basins, and all it takes is a little bit of water to tip it over, carry that sediment across the divide to begin this process. Um, so we see evidence of that in the Southwest as well. Um, and then the last mechanism, uh, aggradational piracy, is really just a river that's aggrading. And it eventually can either laterally cut into the barrier or fill, spill up, or fill up and spill over that barrier, uh, integrating those two basins. So uh, it's a great question, and it's actually um, the lake overflow part of it is really fascinating and something that we're looking at for sure. So did that address everything? Uh, could you talk about the timing of uh, sure. the, all those events? Yeah. Or so, so. Similar timing or millions of year window. 
yeah, so in the southwest, the, the rivers we're talking about were happening about two and a half million years ago or so. Based, and the dates we showed tonight kind of point to that as well. Um, when we're talking about the upper Midwest, there's um, a lot of different stories related to deglaciation, where lakes were forming as glaciers were melting, and these lakes then can spill over and have catastrophic floods that carve these, these river systems and these valleys. Um, and so that, you know, in Dr. Wickert's work, we're talking about uh, about two and a half million years ago in the Minnesota River Valley, we're talking about probably 13 and a half thousand years ago based on our, our dates in this work. Um, so it can happen at any time. There seems to be, you know, when we get these lakes filling up, a trigger for it like uh, climatic change that's really responsible for it. Um, but we do see that these basins can also fill up without it, with just sediment filling up over time and spilling over as well. So thanks, Mark. Oh, Terry's getting exercise. Yeah, he did it. <laughs> There's one behind you first, Don. Come back. Oh, thank you. Uh, okay. Thanks, Phil. Yeah. Uh, hey, I liked your last answer. I was um, one of the times when I was investigating some stuff for the climatology class. Back at that border that you were talking about, the glacial cycles were a lot faster. Uh, it turns out that uh, axial tilt was actually the driving force 800,000 years ago and, and backwards. And then this side of 800,000 years, it's the eccentricity cycles that run at about 100,000 year periods. And interestingly enough, the longest interglacial is at 450,000 years ago. And I noticed you had a 460,000 year date. I thought that was quite fascinating. Anyway, just a few comments there, some food for thought down the road. but. Uh, those early glacial cycles would give you lots of pulses, probably not as intense as like the last three or four that we've had, but there would have been more numerous ones. Anyway, sure. something to chew on. Th thank you, Marty. Yeah, and, and one of the major issues in the Southwest is that uh, the paleoclimate records aren't great. So trying to reconstruct what the sort of precipitation was like back then and how wet it truly was is not well constrained. But that's something we're working on and, and there's some folks that have develop um, models that can actually help us sort of fill up the basin and figure out what that would take. And so I think that's a major part of what we're gonna do next to try to sort out what was happening, so, yeah. So for we now, flatlanders here in Minnesota, can you, one, tell us a little bit about how the Minnesota River Valley is not flat, that it's a very energetic landscape, sure. and two, which sort of what directions, what are you doing now in this landscape? We know what you're doing in Arizona and where that's gonna go and oh, it's happening everywhere in the world, but what's, what are all the interesting applications of all of this yeah. right here? Yeah, so I had a, a slide on it, kind of briefly went through it. Um, the main thrust of things moving forward right now is, is really looking at the rivers in the upper Midwest. And, and uh, part of that is derived from understanding uh, the importance of understanding landslide hazards and things like that, trying to understand how these landscapes evolve so people don't die, um, but also so we understand where these potential events might occur and maybe we can do something to mitigate those consequences. But for me, just for intellectual curiosity's sake, I, I like to try to understand how these river valleys form to begin with. And so the Minnesota River Valley has been sort of a, a thing I've been tinkering with for the probably, what, seven years or so now. Uh, and as you saw, we had the first ever dates from uh, terraces in the Minnesota River Valley presented here tonight. And those haven't been published yet, so you guys are the first to see those. Um, and what we're trying to do currently is we have a current graduate student that's actually mapping out stream terraces in the Minnesota River Valley. And we want to do more geochronological work in the Minnesota River Valley to understand how this landscape has evolved through time. And what we know is that Lake Agassiz, this big glacial meltwater lake, played a crucial role in creating this, this valley. But, um, you know, I've sort of been annoyed with the sort of longevity of just accepting um, researchers uh, sort of, you know, sort of hypotheses from the 1800s. I wanna to try to figure out what's really going on in this landscape. And it seems to me, based on the landforms and data that we have, that it's much more dynamic than anybody ever has talked about before. So that's a major crux of what we're gonna keep doing. Uh, on top of that, we've uh, recently, uh, and I say we, I'm talking about uh, research colleagues of mine, uh, like Dr. Wickard at the University of Minnesota, 
uh, have submitted an NSF proposal to work on the Lake Superior Basin. Uh, and the Lake Superior Basin would have spilled out uh, in the past to create much of the St. Croix River Valley as well, too. So we're working on uh, trying to get funds to do that work as well, to try to understand what's going on up there. So, um, so there's a lot going on, and really I've started to reroute my focus mostly to the upper Midwest instead of the Southwest now, too. So, thanks. Yep, yep. Any other questions? Yeah. I think you just answered that, Phil, but you say, where is this? That's obviously the North Shore. So yep. could you just give us a little more detail about what you and the students are gonna be doing? Yeah, so this NSF proposal that we submitted is going to uh, intricately evolve uh, Earth Science BS students and Geography MS students, without which I couldn't do much of the work that I've been doing for the last seven or eight years. And uh, they are going to be helping me address parts of this jigsaw puzzle and also working with U of M students and U of M faculty, uh, really to understand the history of the Lake Superior Basin, uh, the rivers of the North Shore, and how they've evolved in response to the Lake Superior Basin's changes, but also the outlets of the Lake Superior Basin, like the St. Croix River Valley. Um, and so I, I just want to you know, emphasize the fact that I've taken the teaching scholar philosophy to heart um, that I was taught when I first arrived here at MSU. And so a lot of this future work is tied to that, integrating my classes, the students and programs um, that we have with that research and trying to really expand this work into the future. So. Anyone else? Great comments and questions. No way, Marty, you're kidding me. <laughs> no, here I go. <laughs> Were you kidding or? No. Okay, good. <laughs> got, your, got your exercise. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Phil, I, I do have a question. I also uh, have a comment for our, our new president. Uh, it's, first of all, it's nice to see you transitioning over to uh, Minnesota. And President Inch, when we interviewed Phil, that was very evident. We did a drive through the Minnesota River Valley. Let me tell you, this guy was excited at everything he was seeing. So it's good to see that. Um, could you elaborate a little bit on uh, on the role of the Earth Lab and some of this uh, research that has been done and is on the docket for the future? Because that's kind of a relatively new thing, and I'm thinking a lot of folks in the audience probably are not familiar with that. Yeah. Um, so uh, what, 2021, right? We founded the Earth Lab, is that right? 2020, something like that. Um, yeah, uh, it, it had been in the works for a long time, uh, but uh, we did uh, get this new laboratory facility that uh, has two directors, Dr. Mark Bowen and Dr. Ron Shermer in the room. Uh, and this uh, laboratory basically opens the door for us to be able to do this kind of work. It allows us to analyze soils, it allows us to analyze uh, paleoclimate proxies that allows us to conduct archaeological work to try to understand um, essentially you know, the last 20,000 years or so in, in Minnesota, we can actually do a lot to understand what's happening here in a variety of landscapes. Uh, we can prep for geochronological work that we can then send samples off to laboratories. Um, and we can do a lot of really critical work hands-on here that we used to have to go to other places to do. And so really what this does, having the Earth Systems Lab here, is opens the door for Minnesota State to be a regional hub of this kind of work. And I think this is a, a critical thing that we did um, really to advance and grow our programs, but also to grow our capacity and research at this institution. So hopefully that, uh, that sort of summarizes it up. I've been trying to get this lab for a long time and I'm very, very happy it's here. So any other questions? <laughs> so if I were a student interested in doing this work, mm -hmm. how do I find you, which classes do I take, and how many of your past students, where are they, what are they doing? So I, I'm not going to say it in isolation. I would talk about Dr. Bowen, I would talk about Dr. Shermer, I would talk about myself and say that our students are doing a lot of really cool things. Um, some of them are off in PhD programs at big time institutions right now. Uh, some of them are uh, working in government agencies. Some of them are working in engineering firms. Uh, all of them are doing fantastic work from what we've done. Now, if you're curious and you want to get involved in this kind of stuff, email one of us. Email Dr. Shermer, email myself, email Dr. Bowen, and let's talk. 
Um, the three of us work very closely together uh, and we integrate all of our students so that they get a high impact experience, not just from one of us, but from all three of us. And the other really cool thing that's happened in the last few years is Dr. Andrew Wickard at the University of Minnesota is also integrated with us in the Earth Systems Lab. So the resources of the big institution in the state, the University of Minnesota, is coming here too because I think he realized uh, the work that we're trying to do and the impact we're trying to have. So we're building collaborations across the state of Minnesota through the Earth Systems Lab as well. So I'm open to any students that are interested. I'd love to talk to you. So. Any final question? All right, well, excellent job. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was outstanding, and thank you all for coming. Thank you for joining us on Zoom. And tonight, I'm very pleased to announce that the 2023 Douglas R. Moore Faculty Research Lectureship Award is presented to Dr. David Sharlin in the Department of Biological Sciences. You're supposed to wave here, yeah. I had an opportunity to uh, talk with Dr. Charlin a few weeks ago, and it was a really interesting conversation about the work that he is doing, and I understood some of it. Uh, the presentation will focus on two interconnected areas of our work, research in the importance of thyroid hormone in the nervous system development, and how we are using this knowledge to examine whether human-made chemicals released into the environment can disrupt thyroid hormone-mediated development. I understand some of that. So congratulations to the faculty members who responded to the call for proposals this year. I understand it was a very, very good group. And as you know, the Douglas R. Moore Award applicants are interviewed and selected by a committee of past award recipients. And I want to thank this year's selection committee and especially the chair, Dr. Gina Wagner, who's back there somewhere, I think. So thank you for the work that went into this and thank you for selecting people as carefully as you do. I also wanna thank all of the people that make this happen, Terry being one, but all of the people that work to organize this series. It's important, as I said at the beginning, that we showcase the great talents that are going on on this campus and as you, it was just pointed out, we have other universities that are bigger than us, but coming here to share with what we are doing, and the part that really engages me is the level to which our students are able to perform at high levels that you wouldn't expect in the kinds of courses that they would take in other institutions. I think it's a real testament to the teacher-scholar model. It's a real testament that we believe in our students and that we will invest th time and energy because our students can perform at such a high level. So thank you to all of the teacher scholars that do that. It's remarkable work and I appreciate it. I think our students appreciate it. I also wanna thank the people that are able to put this on so that we can stream, so the videographers, the audiologists, and the people that have set up a little catering out back so that we can have some, some snacks when we end this. And you know, I just wanna say thank you to all of those that, that went to make this a special evening. Thank you for the work that you have done and the, the quality of the presentation. And you know, I, I've only, in the very short time I've been here, I've been to here and the Twin Cities, and that's all I know about Minnesota. But this summer, I think we're gonna go, go ahead north to the North Shore, because I hear it's really pretty up there, and the slide seems to indicate that. So that, that, concludes, <laughs> that concludes this evening's event. Thank you for coming here, much appreciation. <laughs>